Hey Rebels, my name is Matthew Barton. Welcome to the Rebellion Brewing Podcast. Saskatchewan's local hop scene is fairly new in the grand scheme of things, but just like our local craft beer scene, it's growing very fast. Justin Shepard and his family at JGL Shepherd Farms have been cranking out some kick-ass hops in the last couple of years. Some of them you may have actually tasted in our Comet Solo Crush or Cashmere Solo Crush last year. Today, Justin is sitting down with me to dig into the meat and potatoes of this year's Sask Hop Experience. So let's get into it. Justin, welcome to the show. Thanks, Matthew. Happy to be here. How's it going? Things are awesome. Things are turned into a nice sunny day. Life is good on a hops farm. To paint a picture for the audience, I guess I've got to say that the whole Rebellion crew is out here today checking out the hop farm. Yeah, it's been fantastic to show uh, new faces to a hop farm. Some people have no idea what a hop plant looked like before today. And some people are experienced, such as yourselves and Mark, who've come out every year for a few years now. So we have a, a wide range of audience today. From the point that we record this, I think it's going to be a few more weeks until we start pulling hops off the uh, off the vine. Yeah, we're looking around September 1st. Uh, so we're roughly a week away from harvest for some varieties. Uh, today we were smelling some varieties that had some really nice aromas and started to feel like they're getting a bit close to harvest, but we're still probably a week away. One of the things that struck me when you were walking through the field was you were saying one day they won't be ready. And literally the next day you boom, you can smell it. The oil's there. It's ready to go. Yeah. They change really quickly. It's pretty remarkable how fast that they really build up those oils. And when you decide, okay, today is that perfect day where we should be harvesting. This is it kind of like hair on fire, all hands on deck? It's a very exciting moment when you decide this variety needs to come off right now. I know when I walk in there, you can feel the temperature change and the humidity changes. And even on today, such as like uh, the rain that we've been having for the last couple of days, it's still really noticeable when you walk in there. Yeah, it is. It's a different, uh, it's like a micro ecosystem in there. It, it has its own humidity, it has its own temperature, but it, it, it felt pretty nice today. I don't have a ton of perspective on the drought. I know it was really, really rough for the barley farmers. So on last week's episode, guys were just saying it's a bad year for barley. They're getting their butts kicked. How did it affect you guys? Yeah, our area definitely had a little more rainfall uh, than, than most. So overall, the grain crops in our area do look like they should be okay. Um, but for hops, we do rely on irrigation. So we have the capacity and the ability to add water whenever we really need to. Some additional rainfall would definitely have, have helped out and made it easier. But ultimately, low rainfall leads to lower disease pressure. So there are pros and cons when you have irrigation uh, to, to having a dry summer. Really? There's a, there's a trade-off or a balance? Yeah, absolutely. In areas where hops are very wet, where you have a lot of rainfall, you tend to have more disease. And so then you have to treat that disease and you actually have more problems with your hops. And that's really why the hop industry moved west originally, where they ended up in Yakima, because it's a dry land desert. Um, and, and that's why they had that water they were able to irrigate. So in theory, our conditions this summer were actually very similar to what Yakima, Washington would have went through this summer. When you talk about them moving west for water, uh, I think of Yakima being very mountainous and we are very flat. Um, what kind of strategies did you have to put into place to irrigate properly? Yeah, that's a, it's a really important part for our farm to build the water storage because we don't have wells or we don't have subsurface moisture to draw from. We had to expand our existing dugouts. Uh, we expanded it nearly four times larger uh, that was a couple years ago, and that decision looks pretty good today. So we still have, we've definitely drawn down that water supply this summer, but we have enough, we don't need, if we did not get any snow over the winter, we'd still be okay for next year. So we have, we have enough storage sitting there. 
to me, I would have no clue uh, when it comes to planning a hop farm and your thinking ahead it's, it seems like you guys had a crystal ball and it, it called the future correctly for you in this case it's something that we can actually protect against we we can't handle when we have too much rain because we can't control mother nature but but this was one of those areas that we planned for and i think we did a good job of getting this one right <laughs> i think you guys should be really proud of that uh, I, I think it shows a lot of foresight one of the things that uh i've been talking about with people is water in terms of uh, Saskatchewan's agriculture industry as a whole and how all of us, urban, rural, um, all these different sectors need to be thinking very, very smart about water. And when you were kind of explaining what you guys do, I was like, uh, they're, they're ahead of the game. Like they, they're light years ahead. What's driving that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I don't know what actually drove that. We just realized we are in a dry area. Let's try to be proactive in this area. Let's try to be efficient. Um, we know at some point we're going to enter into a dry period and we're going to have periods of wetness here. So trying to be able to plan for that. And uh, I, I don't think there's a great answer of why we did it. And looking back, I think we, we have succeeded in this regard. Uh, and so it has worked. <laughs> I know it, it feels like um, you're trying to thread a needle a little bit. Uh, it sounds like that's a very common theme with uh, agriculture, but especially so for hops. Yeah, yeah. Agriculture has such a diverse range. No two seasons are alike. And this year was just unique to itself. And we had to deal with the challenges that came up. And this year that was uh, e extreme heat or record heat for a prolonged period of time. And if you look at the hops today, I would say they handled it really, really well. They are like gorgeous and lush and kind of like, plump looking even though even the baby ones look like really happy yeah yeah and that's just getting enough water and nutrients and doing a great job our our team did a good job all summer managing all their needs making sure we controlled weeds um, all of that adds up at the end of the year to making sure your hop plants look how they do i know uh me personally i've been advocating for a hell of a lot more comet beers uh, I got to taste that last year and it had like that fuzzy peach candy kind of flavor and that really nice tropical citrus. Like it was just a really beautiful present hop. And I'm like, oh man, can we do that again this year? Do you think? Yeah, I can't wait. I, we have more Comet this year. So I hope, I hope you get your wish and you can find it in numerous beers this coming year. It's it, the hop, the, the Comet crop looks really nice and I'm excited for drinking it as well. What about that cashmere? I know we did cashmere last year. Cashmere as well looks really good. Cashmere is a later variety, and that's the thing that some varieties are pretty close to harvest, and some are the better part of three weeks away. And cashmere is one where there's lots of flowers on them, but we haven't actually got to smell any aromas, and it's going to be into September before we get to really see how those are. But definitely excited for, for another year of maturation on that cashmere crop. <laughs> What other beers in Saskatchewan can people find your hops? I know because people come to me and they say, where can I find more JGL Shepherd hops? Because they see the logos on our cans. They see us talking about it and how excited we are, but they know it's elsewhere. Where can they go? Yeah. Sometimes you you may not even know you're drinking a JGL uh, hopped beer. Um, so some of our friends are Pile of Bones and Regina also uses a lot. Um, you can find them in, in Saskatoon, groups like Nine Mile. And even if you're looking at uh, kind of a larger brewery, you might find them in a great Western beer as well. Really? That's awesome. Like, it, it's great to see that other breweries are seeing what potential possibilities there are. Yeah, absolutely. Whether you're small to large, uh, our hops can work. We can find a way to make them work. From your guys' perspective, when it comes to local, do you hear from customers who are drinking beer to say, I bought that beer because I knew it had Saskatchewan grown hops in it. Yeah, I think definitely people love that local story and they love that local story even more when it tastes good. And I, I think ultimately that's what we care about is it's fantastic. It's from Saskatchewan, but the fact it's incredible world-class beer, that definitely makes it easier. There's something you said this morning that really resonated with me was um, it's not enough to be local. You'll get the first sale being local, but really the second sale came because you were good. Yeah. And I always liken us to craft beer. There are partners, but craft beer really, it's, it's fairly easy to get somebody to try something once. 
everyone will give it a go. Uh, but, but really for them to come back a second time, then a third time, and then really to become a partner, it, it, it quality is first and foremost, it needs to be there and it always has to be good and has to have that consistency. Well, I would say if you could make Comet that much more amazing this year, I mean, uh, I'm 100% behind it. We'll, we'll try. We only have we have one row of it, uh, but it's a special row, Matthew, just for you. <laughs> it's got my name on it, yeah. right on the sign. <laughs> You've got to have like a million brand new stories. I know you guys, you have some new equipment that you've put in and some new techniques. What's something that's really stood out for you this year? Yeah, I think this year, it's just another great year of working with my family. Really, it's a family farm, like showing people around. It's like, there's an aunt, there's an uncle. Today, my father-in-law is here. It's it's a lot of fun to have people interested in both working with us, but also that they have a good time coming out here as well. And a day like today where they get to come out and hang out with brewers or taproom staff and really learn for themselves. Because a lot of times my family maybe doesn't drink a lot of craft beer but they're definitely learning to, and they're definitely learning to appreciate it because of meeting people and having beers in front of them where they're like, Hey, this is really easy to drink. It's not too bitter. It's not And that's kind of the worry, you know, with a lot of people in Saskatchewan is like, Oh, it's hoppy. They just describe it as hoppy, which sounds delicious, but, but it has taken time to convince them of that. But you're slowly converting them. I think so. I think whether it started out with the kind of craft lagers or craft ales was a good place. The odd stout, you slip in there. And uh, today, Hazy was a, a, a big fan with multiple uncles. They were saying how good it was. And I don't know if that would have happened three years ago. <laughs> I like that you converted your uncles to Hazy IPA. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of fun. When we think about putting a face to the the people who are creating the thing we often say we want everybody at rebellion to know us on a first name basis how many people work at jgl shepherd farms yeah so seasonally there's definitely more people in spring and and then at harvest time there's oftentimes more people um, but throughout the summer there's anywhere from four to eight people around most days doing uh whether it's mechanic work on the equipment, getting ready for harvest or training plants, working in the hop yard, uh, th- there's a large amount of manual labor. No matter how much you automate hops, you always are going to need people around to do those sorts of physical tasks. It doesn't seem like it's at the place where robots can just walk in and do their robot thing. It, it looks like you need the dexterity and the intelligence and the flexibility of humans to really get in there and do the stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I think we all have the dream of how how can we automate more? How can we add machines to do some of those unpleasant tasks of grow, of being on a farm? But but for now, humans have the have the control. When it comes to size of the hop farm, how can people picture in their minds how big this place is without coming here? Yeah, so our farm is 10 acres, which when you think of it from a grains and oilseed perspective, that'd be quite small or it'd be a quite small area. Uh, But if you have a garden and you go out and you have a quarter of an acre garden, um, this is about the same amount of labor it would take for you to per per unit to, to do that sort of work. So just think of a very, very, very large garden and working on that by hand uh, all year round. When a lot of farmers ask us questions, they put things in terms of bushels. So how many, how many bushels does, do you get to make with beer? You know, how many bottles did you get out of that bushel? Uh, when you talk about like units per acre or something like that, is, is the dollar value comparable? Does it make sense or is it kind of this wild renegade thing? Cause you just love craft beer and you love craft hops. Oh, we definitely love craft beer and love craft hops, but ultimately it is a business. And so our 10 acres would be equivalent to maybe 500 acres of grain land when you look at it on a uh, output base basis. Um, it, it might be a little bit more, but so we deal in pounds for hops and hops can range anywhere from a thousand pounds up to 3000 pounds, which would be a kind of a really heavy yielder. Right. I I think that helps me kind of conceptualize in my brain the value of what's going on here. So you've got a smaller parcel of land, but you're putting out a lot of product. Yeah, absolutely. It's 
we 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 rent out some grain land as well and the uh the grain land is about equivalent to our 10 acres of hops so it's it makes a hops it a little bit goes a long ways when you say you've got 10 acres how much more is there to go we look at the saskatchewan market we know craft beer constitutes all the breweries together about five percent of the current market we think we can ambitiously take that to 20 percent in the next five to ten years so uh when i look at you guys and i say how big are you gonna get yeah that's a really tough question some days because hops take three four or five years to mature um so we're still increasing yield every year even though our size isn't growing just because the plants mature and we're able to better care for them so we haven't got to a point where we're oversaturated where we are producing too much on our current land base we've really designed our infrastructure to best handle roughly 10 maybe 12 acres our harvester for example is really in that sweet spot able to do about 10 or 12 acres per year so we've really built for this size uh, in order to go bigger it would be a very big leap uh, into the unknown for sure. <laughs> I, f- I think when that happens to breweries, you kind of, uh, you, you clench a little bit and you're like, oh, can we do this? <laughs> yeah, we, we aren't there yet. We're, we want to, we want to best maximize what we currently have and do a, do a great job. We've still got new varieties coming on that we've never sold yet. So we're really excited for some of these new varieties as well. Well, I, I, Every time I get to talk with you or, or get pictures or, or fire back some comments on Twitter, I can tell when I get to tell people we have Saskatchewan grown hops in this beer, there's like this sense of pride and connection. So I'm, I'm really glad that we get to come together and kind of build that. It's, uh, it feels good. I don't, that's not a really great question, but I kind of just wanted to throw it open to you. What's, what's next for JGL Shepherd Farms? Yeah, it, it's a lot of fun because we know Saskatchewan's a barley province. And it's fun to work alongside barley ingredient uh, farmers. That's where we are. We're ingredient producers. And it's been a lot of fun to work with brewers. And in, once we get done harvest in four weeks, then the fun begins where we start getting to where we get to taste the success of our harvest. And it's hard to beat that. That's awesome, man. Well, I guess I just want to say thanks for your time today. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming out. Rebels. Thanks for listening today. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, be sure to join us on our brand new Facebook group page, The Rebellion Brewing Podcast. I'm going to include links in the show notes so you can find all about JGL Shepherd Farms and on your favorite social media platform. I'm also proud to let you know that we're members of the Saskatchewan Podcast Network. It's a one-stop shop for tons of locally produced shows from across our province. You can find them at saspodcastnetwork.com. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Untapped so you don't miss out on the latest in Sascraft beer news. Thank you for joining the rebellion. <laughs>